we are meeting today uh three years i mean three and a half years since the judgment uh, in the supreme court which uh, repealed read down uh, section 377 from the ipc to exclude consensual uh, sexual acts which occur in the private realm from the sphere of uh, criminalization uh, and i think uh, i mean i'll begin with this because it's been so central also to how the movement has been shaped and it has grown in the past uh, like the journey of over a decade like a little uh, nearly say two decades and a little more uh, where uh, i think uh, one of the slogans here which was i mean i don't know uh, if it's commonly used uh, in other cities as well but uh, uh, i mean it encapsulates the fact that uh, section 377 has come to become central uh in some senses to even the legal limited battle that uh, has been fought for uh, decriminalization uh wherein like a slogan commonly given here is kaun sa kanoon sabse badtar uh, badtar 377 uh meaning i mean uh, that uh, i mean i mean kind of showing that uh, section 377 is that law which needs to be read down or repealed if we are to speak of any form of uh, recognition from the state uh now like now that we are meeting uh post 2018 at a time when that law is no longer uh i mean it's no longer uh, functional in the sense that it no longer criminalizes uh, sexual acts in the private realm how do we then look at that slogan and what more uh, forms i mean actually there is i mean uh, in a uh i mean coming together of people in celebration in 2018 after the judgment came out uh, we all met at jantar mantar and then like when you come together you obviously sing and uh, dance and shout slogans but as we were shouting we realized that this slogan this one slogan has been so central that we no longer have many other things to say which is i think uh, kind of central to the problem uh if i mean if we look at the trajectory that <clears throat> the queer movement has uh, taken in india the reading we circulated uh, by john d emilio i think conceptualizes sexuality in a particular way which is useful uh, to understand any kind of battle whether it is legal or uh, uh, in any other realm when we speak of uh, uh i mean uh, recognition uh and i mean obviously it's uh not going to be so easily translatable to the indian context but i think it's still helpful in conceptualizing sexuality like whether is it it's an orientation it's an identity it's just encapsulating behaviors which have shifted historically or it's like a social identity or a social form uh so i mean there are different ways in which sexuality has been understood and i feel that that uh, reading has helped me and i mean in my understanding and in critiquing the uh, uh, argument of uh, privacy which has been central uh, i i'll now i mean i think i'll go quickly into a brief overview of like how privacy came to be one of the central arguments central planes upon which the legal battle has been fought and what has been uh the trouble with uh, privacy and i mean it's uh when pointed out it has been debated even while petitions were being filed uh since the 90s so it's not like there was a homogeneity within the community that this is the path one has to take but somehow because one uh, came in interaction with the state one argument also took precedence over others uh so i mean briefly speaking uh So in the 90s, we are seeing the first uh, such challenge to Section 377 by the AIDS Bhedba Virodhi Andolan, uh, which is, I think, a part of the history which is often lost. Also, I mean, unless you are actually doing uh, whatever academic work or any kind of other work on the community, that's one part which is lost. We enter the history from Nas petition, but actually there is a history prior to that also, which actually that petition. Uh, importantly uh, called for a complete repeal of section 377 not a reading down uh, and the repeal was sought not on the ground, grounds of privacy or even dignity for that matter it was 
with respect to the kind of uh, work that ABVA is Bhedra uh, Virodhi Andolan was doing uh, among uh, communities and particularly inside prisons also for the prevention of AIDS. And obviously, like, because homosexuality is not recognized, uh, they uh, <coughs> entered trouble with uh, authorities uh, in that kind of preventive work regarding HIV AIDS. And this is also the time we are seeing a lot of funding entering like that sphere because like in the 80s, we are seeing AIDS uh, take on the like shape of a pandemic globally and particularly uh, affecting uh, queer communities more so. So, I mean, there's a certain kind of uh, congealing that's happening from, say, uh, the 90s to the early 2000s, where uh, firstly, Section 377 is becoming central, uh, but like it starts from a complete reading down, which is obviously uh, rejected, as a complete repeal, which is then rejected in the court. And then, uh, like from the 2000s, we are seeing uh, a gradual shift where uh, the argument becomes that of uh, the right to dignity read through the right to privacy and uh, thereby calling for a reading down of uh, Section 377 to exclude uh, sexual acts in the private uh, realm. Now, I mean, this is complicated in two ways. I mean, one is that from within the community, there's uh, not absolute consensus that it should, this should be the sole uh, trajectory one takes. Uh, also around that time you have debates uh, and I mean there's other kind of work also which has been done to show that uh, like apart from say gay men or transgender people who are acting uh, I mean sexually or are clearly like sexually deviant in that sense in public in appearance or in acts uh, this law is actually not being used to target people in the private realm in any case and there are other people like lesbian women for that matter who are being targeted through various other kinds of laws like for instance the writ of habeas corpus uh, has been shown to be used repeatedly by families of uh, queer women to target them and to break apart like uh, lesbian couples uh, and i mean in addition to habeas corpus there's also the law of kidnapping uh, forceful uh, confinement and all of these laws which have been used, which you can't really argue against these laws. I mean, you can't say that there shouldn't be a section for kidnapping or there shouldn't be a habeas corpus, uh, but these have been used repeatedly in uh, the court of law by uh, families to uh, target women. And uh, I mean, the second problem is that, I mean, privacy, uh, while its uh, definition was expanded through the di different judgments, it still remained a negative uh, concept in the sense that privacy is privacy from the state or from the state's intervention. So it's not seen as a positive right in the sense that the state doesn't then need to do anything to ensure that this right to privacy and dignity is actually uh, enjoyed by all. Rather, it just uh, uh, stops itself from intervening in the private realm. And this is something that's been uh, critiqued, like not just within uh, the movement, but also like in the history of uh, the women's movement, both in India and uh, uh, in the US and other contexts, that privacy solely used as a negative right cannot uh, be the grounds for any kind of politics of liberation. It can be the grounds for a politics of inclusion to some degree, but if it's liberation that we are interested in ultimately, then that can't be our uh, sole, uh, I mean, grounds for arguing against the state or even within uh, like the, uh, any kind of community if we are organizing. Uh, so yeah, the, these are the two problems that uh, movements have run into and also the fact that who has privacy in that sense that who has the absolute right to actually like in his or her household behave like a like private dignified citizen is also a very limited uh, right in that sense uh, and that's where i think uh, d emilio's article is also uh, useful but before getting into that i just want to like uh, look at another kind of critique which has been done of privacy to just substantiate through example, uh, where like in the US, uh, Roe versus Wade became an important judgment in the women's movement as it uh, 
uh, on the grounds of privacy gave women the right to abortion and i mean it's an important judgment and it's also a uh, like uh, frequently cited ju judgment within the nas judgment which first uh, uh, read down section 377 like when nas is speaking of precedence they're going back to roe versus wade among other like two key judgments but in the us uh, context what we're seeing is that uh, <coughs> once roe versus wade comes uh, i've lost my voice completely you're audible shambhavi Oh, actually, yes, so uh, message. Ha. Huh. So, uh, Roe versus Wade. Like after that, we are seeing that there's actually no, uh, because it again gives the right to abortion as uh, the right given to a private citizen. Uh, we see that there's, I mean, gradual, uh, I mean, uh, defunding in public abortion centers and also. uh i mean because the state doesn't because the law doesn't say that the state then has a responsibility to ensure that this uh, right to abortion is effectively uh, exercised by women uh, it means that basically there is no compulsion on the state to fund uh, like public abortion clinics which can actually ensure that any woman can then avail that right so i mean gradually we are seeing that even though the law is there and i mean then obviously like uh, with shifting regimes and with more uh, right wing regimes coming in there's an actual attack on that uh, legal victory also uh, which we are seeing constantly like in the us context that the, it's always up for debate whether the right to abortion shall even be there as that limited uh, private uh, right as well so i mean on two fronts we are seeing the uh, one is that like with the decline in like struggles on the street ensuring that the right is actually exercised we are seeing that any right wing uh, government can then easily dilute uh, such a, a legal victory and secondly all governments have then washed their hands off of like ex like mean ensuring that the right is actually exercised by all uh, women so i mean it's essential to our own understanding of then how do we see the right to privacy here is it then only going to be a right enjoyed by a select few uh, who have in any case like uh, i mean despite the fact that there was violence and there was uh, harassment uh, by the police by the family by authorities despite that uh, there has always been one section which has been able to enjoy that right even before section 377 is read down in 2018 finally so i mean are we going to then limit our struggle to that uh, section and then what is the way uh, forward in that i think uh, understanding sexuality as it as a whole is also important where uh, i mean uh, against a kind of whatever homophobic uh, society or uh even i mean state against a kind of heteronormativity there have there have been several arguments which have been uh given uh which i think which is what uh, dmlo's article also deals with that one kind of argument is that homosexuals have always existed and it's only like over time through struggle that people have come out and asserted their identity and therefore we are seeing more homosexuals in uh the world after a certain point of time but dmlo is arguing that that's actually not uh, the case the homosexuals have not always existed homosexual behavior has always existed in society that's not up for debate but homosexual as a category as an identity has not always existed and it's actually in relation to capitalism and how capitalism reorganizes the realm of production and reproduction that uh the category of homosexual also emerges so i mean it's a large uh, sweep of like history that dmlo uh, covers but if i put it shortly then what is like basic argument is that uh like with capitalism we are seeing two kinds of changes within the family first that the family is no longer a unit of production like as opposed to before uh, capitalism in other modes of production under feudalism the family is both a sphere of reproduction as well as production so the like any productive activity is basically with the coming in of capitalism in a particular kind of factory uh, mode of production the family is no longer that uh, unit 
however like despite this kind of shift in the nature of the family uh, there's also a strengthening of the family in other ways that the family actually becomes the primary realm and i mean in the us context he's writing so he's also looking at the nuclear uh, family particularly that that becomes the primary realm in which all your other needs are met basically all kinds of care work all kinds of emotional labor and uh, physical labor is then uh, to reproduce a human being so that he is a productive uh, person a productive worker in society is then all these needs are then met uh, by the family so in that sense uh, even though uh, i mean and this we see that it's with the coming in of capitalism that certain unnatural sexual acts are criminalized also where whereas it's not like uh, i mean it was easily accepted prior to capitalism however it's codified in a particular way uh, for the first time with the coming in of capitalism because capitalism is like inherently interested in uh like securing the heterosexual family to meet its own purposes so it's not like it's uh, just generally uh, homophobic because like it doesn't like unnatural uh, sexual acts but it needs that there is a heterosexual family that uh, ensures that care work is privatized in society and it's never seen as a social uh, concern so and he's saying that uh, i mean despite that happening capitalism also creates conditions where women and men are able to leave the family to enter work spaces to come to the cities and be in sex segregated spaces which allow for people to engage in different kinds of sexual behaviors which they would have otherwise not engaged in had uh, their primary whatever had the household been the primary uh, unit of production so i mean what he's saying is that at one hand you uh, see the family being strengthened both ideologically and like socially as the unit where care work is supposed to happen and uh, on the other side you're also seeing that capitalism enables conditions where people are able to come together and form a kind of identity on the basis of their desires for the same sex so in that sense he's saying that capitalism and the growth of uh, gay identity are then closely linked and then he is citing different kind of data to say that over time you are actually seeing a growth in the number of people who identify as gay so it's no not just that people are coming out and they were like repressed for so long but actually many people are taking on an identity which had not existed that till that point but at the same time like where it's um, uh important to go back to the privacy argument is that he is also showing that there are far more uh, gay men in number than lesbian women so it's not like women are not uh, desiring other women sexually uh but women do not have that kind of access to the public space still where they are actually able to uh, leave the household and uh, actually form communities and identities on the basis of their sexual desires so there are desires but they are either not acted on or they are acted on but do not take the form of uh, this kind of an identity so like numerically you can see that there are far more gay men than uh, women identifying as uh, homosexual and uh, i mean this lack of access to the public uh, space is something uh, i mean this he is writing till the context say of 70s or 80s but in india i think we can still we are still in a kind of setup where there are still women who are not entering the public space in that uh, way so the right to privacy then like women do not have that kind of a right to their own private space where that, that can be the sole ground for something uh, like uh, recognition and that cannot be the only kind of uh, politics of liberation that one can imagine so then what uh, can be this uh, politics of uh, liberation i think uh, like we also said uh, as people to watch pride uh, for this session uh, and one clip was i think shared on our social media yesterday uh, which is i think useful in explaining all of these uh, issues that we've discussed so far regarding care work regarding uh, how identities are being formed where i mean housework becomes uh, central to the family where there's an interaction being shown in the movie uh, i mean i don't know how many people have seen uh, the movie but it's uh, basically about this group of uh, gay and lesbian women 
uh, gay men and lesbian women who come together in support of uh, minors who are on strike against the Thatcher government in, I think, late 70s uh, or early 80s. I'm not sure about this. 80s, early 80s. 80s early 80s. And uh, so, I mean, in the process, they ba uh, basically find this uh, mining community in a very remote uh, village in the UK who have uh, no idea about who is it that's like taking, I mean, uh, collecting funds for them. And I mean, the movie is a story of how then like these two groups meet each other and what kind of like happens after that. And I mean, it's um, interesting uh, that one conversation is interesting, like between the wife of a minor and uh, this uh, gay couple who are like part of some, I don't know, they're all whatever. They were all meeting each other for the first time. Uh, and so they're having this conversation where she asks that uh, whether these two men then live together uh, in a, in one house as a man and wife uh, live together. And they're like, yes, uh, we do. And then she's like, uh, then she asks that she has a question uh, for them. And like, uh, I mean, contrary to what uh, the expected questions could have been, her question is then, who does the housework in that scenario if two men are living together as man and wife do. So, I mean, that I think uh, it centrally brings forth the point that like what has been the role of the family since, uh, I mean, historically, even before capitalism, but particularly with the coming in of capitalism, uh, it becomes central for that kind of reproductive labor. And uh, if we do not deal with that question centrally, then I think uh, even limited victories like uh, reading down of Section 377, like uh, recognition on the basis of privacy are not going to remain uh, with us or are not going to actually get uh, uh, operationalized in society in the sense that uh, like the actual structures which lead to a kind of heteronormative structure, which leads to then this kind of violence, which is pervasive in the law, in the state and in the family. Uh, unless we deal with this question of reproductive labor and care work and uh, think of socializing it, think of mechanisms to take it out of the realm of the private family, then we are not going to be able to effectively deal with the question of uh, oppression on the basis of sexuality. Because I think it's uh, important to then ask the question that, I mean, do we want, I mean, as an end goal, as the ultimate goal of any such queer movement, would it be just like the inclusion of more and more categories of people within this kind of existing uh, structure, which is also a path which we have seen uh, movements like in the Western context and also gradually in India take, where, uh, like say in the early 2000s you still had groups i mean you still have groups which uh, speak of these other uh, kinds of politics of sexuality but largely the movement has taken one role where since the reading down of uh, section 377 we are seeing petitions uh, being filed to ask for like recognition of uh, the like marriage the right to marry the right to civil union which uh, was uh, recognized in the west so those kinds of trajectories we are seeing uh, in our context as well, uh, which is not to say that uh, people do not need to have the right to marry or uh, live with the person, a partner of the same sex. However, it's again basically uh, not breaking that uh, link between the family and the capitalist structure when we are uh, actually just centering our demands on these kinds of uh, issues. So I think... Uh, that is one thing uh, and yes uh, recently shadi.com also uh, brought out uh, like changes in their platform to include matchmaking for uh, lgbtq couples uh, which is what i'm saying basically that this kind of uh, inclusion can basically be co-opted very easily by uh, the kind of neoliberal structure we are in today and we are like seeing it every day like we saw it with the women's movement also in some senses where uh, we saw that uh, i mean i mean one trajectory of the movement became then about just in 
empower empowering the individuals to break the glass ceiling and like in that way basically all women then have the potential to empower themselves but until we look at the root of like where this kind of oppression is coming from why is it that uh, homosexuals are actually being oppressed why is it that unnatural sex has actually not been uh, dealt by the law even uh, though we've had recognition uh, it's been on the basis of privacy but uh, there's been nothing said by the law uh, on the thing like on the division between natural and unnatural sex so there is still this kind of i mean ideologically speaking there's still heteronormativity present within the law and also within the kinds of demands uh, which are being uh, raised uh, by the movement so i think i mean i'd like to end with what i began with that now that uh, 377 has been read down and we know that i mean there has been lot that has been said about how sexuality is not just some like is it biological is it social i mean uh, a lot of us i think would like to say that it's actually not biologically determined that's an argument that has been refuted uh, by different kinds of work that's been done historically uh, the emilio's article being one of them so then what kind of society should we imagine where actually this uh, question of uh, sexual preference basically becomes irrelevant to the question of social organization that people are able to engage in whatever behaviors that they wish to that they're able to enter any kinds of relationships but it doesn't become central to how society is organized as a whole it's only when we are able to do make that separation that i think uh, any kind of politics of liberation can be imagined i think i'd like to uh, end with that uh, if like other people have uh, points questions or anything to add to the discussion then we can enter uh, that yeah thanks thank you so much okay just a couple of things before we open up for discussion um for those who who just joined or joined in between um please introduce yourself in the chat box so that we know who are like here um we have a whatsapp group where we generally share updates regarding other study circles and activities in city so we'll share the form and do feel that you would like to see us um one of the reasons why we thought of doing this online study circle series um in bangalore was i mean of course one aspect is that studying history i think is one of the main reasons of doing it is always so that we can learn from it in order to take movement uh, forward in a more informed uh, manner but also we wanted to do it online just to kind of assess uh, the kind of the number of students and the interest of students and youth in the city we're planning to have physical uh, like in person meetings from Feb onwards, hopefully, um, if things with COVID settle down. So, um, just want to let you all know uh, so that you all can stay in touch and hopefully attend those as well. 